From the fall of man to our day, the work of redemption in its effect has mainly been carried on by remarkable, that is extraordinary, communications of the Spirit of God. Jonathan Edwards, The Great Awakening. Today's sermon is based on Acts chapter 2, 1 to 13. My name is Reverend Derek Geller. I'm senior pastor here at McKees Mills Baptist Church, and I want to say God is good. I hope that you're drawing near to God. I hope that you're trying to get closer to Him, and I hope the Spirit of God is really igniting you with great, incredible passion to serve inside of His kingdom. In respect to that, why don't you just pause the tape just for a moment, go get your Bibles, and open up Acts chapter number 2, and reread over a couple of times Acts, this chapter in Acts of 1 to 13, the Pentecost, over and over again a couple of times, just to get the story fresh in your mind before we begin the sermon. Over 2,000 years ago, right before his ascension, the Lord told the disciples to remain in Jerusalem until they received the promised gift of the divine advocate, the Spirit of Truth, who would aid them in the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. Now, we don't really like to wait, do we? That's not something that we're very good at, or at least most people are not. But the disciples were told, don't go anywhere yet. Stay here inside of Jerusalem. The story actually relates to the, the disciples plus the other ones. There was 120 of them actually in the end, the original apostles plus others ones, of course. And they were waiting inside of Jerusalem and waiting and waiting until they received the Holy Spirit. And they were praying for the Spirit's arrival. Knowing that there were none that were truly righteous and that they were going to be sent out like sheep amongst the wolves who would undoubtedly persecute them, the disciples desperately needed the Holy Spirit not only to enable them to live kingdom lives, but also to effectively plant and water seeds of righteousness. In Acts chapter number 2, we are told of the glorious day when the wind and the fire of the Spirit filled the hearts of 120 brethren. And not only were they able to speak in many languages that they never had learned before, but they were also empowered to do great miracles in the name of Jesus Christ. And to the church, there was numbers that were added daily. Wow. Isn't that nice to hear? You know what the reality is, is that we want the same thing. We want to see the numbers of the church grow, not because we want more numbers. That's not why we want. What we really want is to see more people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. For those believers who are in the churches that rarely have a baptism and are left to rejoice seeing a mere visitor come through their doors, it often feels like we're on a spiritual treadmill of regular church attendance, involvement in ministry, seminars, and unendless religious activity. But sometimes I think as churches we feel like we are barren of power and void of any kind of fruit. This, of course, raises all sorts of questions. Was the day of Pentecost a one-time event, or are we too clothed with the same Spirit's power to effectively go out there and make disciples of all nations? What makes a difference between a Christian inside of the church who is progressing and one who is regressing or standing still? Obviously, if we're going to be filled by the Holy Spirit and you just read the chapter over, the 13 verses, then obviously we're going to have some passion. We're going to be excited. We're going to get out there and tell people all about the Lord Jesus Christ with great fire in our hearts. And, and it's going to make a huge impact and a difference because the people are going to know that we believe. I mean, really believe. But what's the difference between a Christian who believes, I mean, really is excited for Jesus, and one that's merely getting by? Surely he who wishes none to be lost has cloaked those uh, with great power from on high, because the fields are very ripe, and surely they have the ability to go out there and tell people about Christ in a manner that is worthy of God's wonderful gift that they have received, salvation. We know God is active today, so how does one ask or receive another awakening? What must one do? I think there are many churches that have asked that question ever since Jesus Christ. For over 2,000 years, they've been asking the question, what must we do to get a true awakening like the day of Pentecost? The following sermon is going to review Acts 2, 1 to 13 to not only see what happened during the original day of Pentecost, but also to understand what is required to ex receive explosive growth in our hearts and to be able to go out in the world and effectively tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at this in great detail. But let's look at the Pentecost itself in some detail right now, just to get a feeling of what originally happened. Receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit happened on a festival known in late Judaism as Pentecost. 
when I think about the day of Pentecost, as I'm sure you're, it's similar for you, the first thing I think about is a New Testament version in Acts. But the reality is Pentecost actually was in the Old Testament. It was a festival. It existed long before the New Testament. It was a second of three great annual festivals of the Jewish people and got its name because it was celebrated 50 days after the Passover. While well, early Hebrew and Aramaic speaking Jews knew this celebration also as the festival of the weeks or the day of the first fruits due to the celebration of the first fruits of grain, it was later celebrated as the anniversary of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. It is fitting that the divine power demonstrated on Mount Sinai under the Old Covenant would once again be shown to announce and to celebrate the New Covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ's blood. On this uh, Jewish holiday, many pilgrims from all over the known world would come to the holy city of Jerusalem to celebrate God's law and his bountiful provisions. It is appropriate that the event that was going to propel the gospel to the ends of the world took place at a time when people from the ends of the known world at that time were in Jerusalem. Well, what happened on this celebration day did not begin the church as the body of Christ. In other words, it wasn't the beginning of the church because the church already existed. The gift of the Holy Spirit empowered the believers to not only have a more intimate and personal relationship with their Savior, but also to obey his command to proclaim the good news to the ends of the world. So that's kind of the beginning of Pentecost. Let's talk about what actually occurred. Okay, let's talk about the wind. While the 120 disciples mentioned in Acts 115 were meeting and praying in the upper room, an incredible life-giving miracle happened. Luke tells us that suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. In the major um, ancient languages of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, wind is often used to symbolize spirit. Wind, after all, is, is of all material things. One of the most spiritual in appearance, it is invisible, ethereal, mysterious. Hence, it's fitting that it would symbolize the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. 2 Samuel 5.24, 22.16, and Job 37.10. In the same way that God breathed into Adam and he received life, people need God to breathe his spirit into them to be born again and receive eternal life. In examining the importance of this glorious event, Charles Spurgeon stated, By him are we quickened at the first. By him we are kept alive afterwards. And by him is the inner life nurtured and increased and perfected. The breath of the nostrils of the man of God is the Spirit of God. Ezekiel's prophesied new heart and the dry bones coming to life was now a reality for the final messianic age had begun on the day of Pentecost. Even though the wind blows where it may and therefore cannot be controlled or subject by any human command, the 120 disciples who entered into the upper room to wait patiently to receive the promised comforter were granted a miraculous gift from heaven that empowered them to cast down every imagination of the loss and effectively fulfill Christ's command to witness the good news, first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria and the world. This was the first sign that the Spirit had been given. So you got this beautiful day of Pentecost in which the wind comes rushing in. It's something that seems like the wind, not necessarily wind, but it came in and it landed upon the 120 disciples. And the reality is, is it was showing that the Messianic age had come. It was a fulfillment of prophecy that the Messianic age had started and would continue to go onwards. There were great miracles that happened during that time period afterwards. And things were quickened, a lot of people say. Things were alive and people were excited. And I can imagine why. Because the Spirit was demonstrating His power in and through their lives. But the wind was not the only symbol that the Holy Spirit had come. The second sign that the Spirit of God had been received was not focused on sound, but on sight. Luke in verse number 3 tells us that they saw what seemed like to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest upon each of them. After having read the stories of Abraham seeing the burning bush, fire in the burning bush, the, the burning bush itself, the, the uh, pillar of fire that guided the Israelites by night, the consuming fire of Mount Sinai, the fire that hovered over the wilderness in the tabernacle, the fire at Mount Carmel, and many other examples, ultimately the Jewish people came to associate fire as a symbol of God's divine presence. 
Receiving this fire was a fulfillment of John the Baptist's promise that one coming after him would not baptize with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with fire, Matthew 3.11. The implications of receiving fire relates to purification, not only of the believer, but the lost as well, Isaiah 4.4, 4, Jeremiah 7.20, Malachi 3.2. Fire not only brings light and warmth to the believers, he calls his own ultimately to come near to him. It ignites them with passion to let their light shine so that their deeds and their witness might point to God the Father in heaven. May a fire burn steadily within to destroy our sin, a holy sacrificial flame to make us whole, burnt offerings unto God, a never-dying flame of zeal for God and a devotion for the cross, Spurgeon. God is is a consuming fire, not only to the saved, but especially to the lost. While our witness is to focus on the good news, it must not be done as an invitation of some form of cheap grace, but it must embrace the truth. The fire also represents the consuming judgment of God, Isaiah 66, 15, verse 18. This consuming judgment of God will forever burn away the chaff of the stubborn and the disobedient in the unquenchable fires of hell if they choose not to accept him. While God's and our love is to be our primary motivation of missions, judgment must be spoken for until one truly knows of the eternal wailing and gnashing of teeth one is going to receive, one's never going to truly know the peril that one is in. Since the tongues of fire fell on all present, praise be to God, that every believer has, was given the passion to be purified by the Spirit and the conviction to preach to the lost souls. We have the Holy Spirit. We have this fire burning inside of us too. The only question, though, becomes, are we being filled by the Spirit? I'm going to talk about that in a few moments, but are we feeling excited for God? Are we feeling like we want to be transformed? Are we receptive to Him, like the apostles were, like the other disciples that were present there? Were we, were, they were accepted. They, they were ready. They were excited. They were on fire. They were really going, you know, to wherever God wanted them to go. But the question is, do we feel that way? When we come into the church, are we expecting God to do great things as well? Are we expecting him to set us on fire, so to speak, and get us up out of our seats and go tell the world all about him? That's the question. I want to go on to the next sign that they had received the Holy Spirit, and that's the speaking of tongues. The third, third sign ultimately happened when they were in the upper room. They were so filled with the Holy Spirit that I think they left that upper room and they went out amongst the people and they started speaking in the other people's languages. The filling of the Spirit is not to be confused with a baptism by the Spirit. While the baptism of the Spirit is but once and places one into the body of Christ, being filled by the Spirit can happen many times in a person's life. It's, not always, it's usually accompanied anyway, most times, by some request by the Spirit to do something supernatural inside of His kingdom. We talk about, you know, I'd like to get more of the Spirit. I'd like to get the Spirit's presence in my life. I'd like to get on fire for Jesus. But be very careful for what you ask for. Because usually that request to be more passionate for Jesus means that we have to do something and we've got to be prepared to do it. The task of those who received the tongues of fire was to speak in tongues the good news to those who were attending at the Pentecost. The 120 did not speak at the ecstasy of 1 Corinthians 14.2, uh, the language of angels of 1 Corinthians 13.1, or the groans of the Spirit that words cannot express, Romans 8.26. They spoke in the local languages of the God-fearing Jews and the proselytes that came for the festival from Egypt, Asia Minor, and Italy, which represented their known world of that particular day. What truly made this miracle, or this miraculous, was that these men were without college education, Acts chapter number 4, and despite being Galilean, who had difficulty pronouncing their speech, they had a habit of swallowing their syllables when they were speaking, they spoke in many different languages fluently and eloquently, and that's what really stunned the people that were around there. Lest we get too caught up in the speaking of tongues, this is just one gift of the Holy Spirit. I have to be careful here. I know that other people have different beliefs in relation to this, but there are other gifts of the Holy Spirit that are mentioned. Uh, I think of 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, lots of different gifts that are given. And not everybody who gets the gift of the Holy Spirit is going to immediately speak in tongues or may ever speak in tongues. But that doesn't mean that we're not saved. Ultimately, the Spirit will give what gifts the Spirit chooses to an individual. And whatever gifts that we get, we're supposed to use for the honor and the glory of God the Father in heaven.
So I want to say first and foremost, just because you get the gift of tongues doesn't mean that you're necessarily, well, it means you're saved, of course, because you got the gift from the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't mean if somebody doesn't get tongues that they're not. I guess that's kind of the way I want to say it. You know what the reality is, is they were given the gift of tongues on this day, the day of Pentecost, because they were to invite every tribe and language and all the people of this world to come under the rule of the Son, to hear the good news that salvation was offered to everyone, regardless of genealogy, nationality, or status. So there was a reason why the tongues were given, so that they could speak to everybody in their dialect. While Babel and Eden were not undone by the day of Pentecost, they were redeemed, and their negative effects only remained on those people who chose to reject the Son. Pentecost, then, is to be seen as the prophesied outpouring of the Spirit of Ezekiel 37, the announcement of the Messianic Age, and the worldwide expansion of the church. This is the way we're supposed to see Pentecost. Okay. Now, let's let's look at the response. What kind of response did they get? Okay, so you got three different things that happened here. You got 120 of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ... Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem, and they're waiting. They're in an upper room. They're praying. They want to receive the Holy Spirit so they can get out and tell everybody about the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyway, while they're waiting and while they're praying, this wind comes in, the first sign, and blows in there, and it seems like wind, it says, and then tongues of fire land upon them, second sign, and the third sign is they speak in the tongues amongst many people. The question becomes, how did the people... Now, remember, these are God-fearing people that have come for the Pentecost. How did they respond to these events? What was the response of the people? To see and hear the Holy Spirit poured out in such an extraordinary power, one would think that everyone, especially these God-fearing Jewish and, and, and proselytes, would automatically leap for joy, or they would fall to the ground prostrate, and they would say, oh my goodness, the Messianic age has come, and guess what? This is a glorious and beautiful time to be alive. You'd think they'd be really excited. While some were amazed and ready to give God the glory, others gave in to skepticism and attributed the miracle as nothing more than gibberish of those filled with new wine. Jesus encountered a similar type of criticism when his opponents said he was doing miraculous work through the power of Beelzebub, which is Mark 3.22. When revival comes, there will always be some believers in the Christian community who will not understand the significance of such event and will try to dismiss it as really occurring. They'll dismiss it off and say it's really not happening. This is a reminder that the miraculous is not self-authenticating, nor does it inevitably and uniformly convince people. There must be the preparation of the heart and the proclamation of the message if miracles are to accomplish their full purpose. Spurgeon. Also from this passage, it is very important to remember that the suddenness of this miracle points to the Holy Spirit as being free and sovereign and not bound by anyone's timing to technique or anyone who tries to take on his power. That's very important for us as Christians to realize that. The disciples, 120 of them, went up into this upper room and they prayed for the Holy Spirit. They didn't command him. They didn't say, Holy Spirit, come now. We want you to come now because we've got a mission that Jesus has given to us. Now you come right now and you do our bidding. That's not what happened. And the same is true today. If we want to have a new awakening, if we want to have the presence of the Holy Spirit and go out and tell the whole world about Jesus, we cannot command him to do this. We must invite him in. And there's a big difference there, very much so. Revival is not fabricated by the church's will but must be asked for in humble submission and joyful expectation that God will do good to his own and in his time. And when revival does arrive, do not worry about what the scoffers might say, but instead rejoice that God felt you worthy of such persecution. So, be filled. Be so filled with the Holy Spirit that God has complete control over your every thought, word, and deed. Leap for joy and fall prostrate at the Father's feet, not as one drunken wine, but as one who relies on his might and his power and his sovereignty to rule over the things seen and unseen. And above all, be ready to say, here I am like Isaiah. Take me. I'm ready to serve with everything that I have. Now, how do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? 
Is it possible? I started off asking that question at the very first of the sermon. Is it possible to have an awakening today? And is it possible to go from being somebody who comes to church every single Sunday and, you know, you go through the routine, you go through the worship, you go through the reading of the, of, of the Bible, you go through listening to the sermon, but it seems like it's repetition and it's not really helping you to grow. How do you go from that to being alive, ignited on fire like these 120 uh, disciples were and really make an impact and a difference in this world? Is that possible? Is that reasonable for us to say we could have another day? of Pentecost, or we call it a day of awakening today. Obviously, we can't have another day of Pentecost because the circumstances are different, but we certainly can have an awakening. So can that happen today? That's the question. Being filled by the Holy Spirit. After having read about the day of Pentecost, one can't help but wonder if revival can happen today and what would it look like? Since the Spirit is the same Spirit when He hovered over the waters in Genesis as He was in Jesus' day when the 120 disciples miraculously spoke in languages or different tongues, one can say confidently, yes, revival can happen today. Absolutely, because the Spirit is the same Spirit back then as the Spirit that we have inside of us today. So yes, it can certainly happen. Well, we certainly cannot command the Spirit to start a revival at our church. What we certainly can and must do is to prepare our hearts to accept one. A revival, that is. The Spirit can bring life to anyone, but chooses only to do so with those who are open and ready to be filled with an unquenchable desire to serve Him. To have this happen, we need to pray that a flake of fire might fall into our bosom, not only to drown out all the puny voices of doubt and uncertainty, but also to ignite passion, to not only know and memorize the Bible, but to humbly bow our knees in total submission and genuine desire to joyfully serve in any way that we are asked. Also, to become ready to receive the Spirit's fire burning within our hearts, we need to humbly ask God to search our hearts, to reveal anything that might offend the Spirit and keep Him from inviting us to be instruments of His righteousness. David did this in Psalms chapter number 139. Um, beautiful passage in which he said, you know what? Search me, God. If you find anything wrong with me, any problems with me, any issues whatsoever, anything that disappoints you, then show it to me and give me the strength and courage to confess that sin and make it right in your sight. And above all, even though it can be frustrating, irritating, even a little bit intimidating, we must be patient and wait for the Spirit's leading in our lives. For it truly is not by, by might nor by power, but by the Spirit, Zechariah 4, 6, that we can do miracles in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we wait, we are sure that the very God who has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit has a glorious plan for every single one of us, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, that will come to fruition but in his time. Let me finish this sermon with a beautiful prayer from Charles Spurgeon. And I want to invite you just to bow your heads wherever you are. And I want you to listen to this prayer. And maybe later on, you can even repeat the prayer. O Spirit of God, Thou art ready to work with us today, even as thou didst them. Stay not, we beseech thee, but work at once. Break down every barrier that hinders the incomings of thy might. Overturn, overturn, O sacred wind. Consume all obstacles, O heavenly fire, and give us both hearts of flame and tongues of fire to preach thy reconciling word to all the nations. For the Lord Jesus Christ's name's sake. Amen. Revival is possible. Absolutely. Of course it is. But we have to wait and we have to ask. It's not something that we can command the Spirit. But if we wait and we ask and we prepare our hearts to meet Him and we are open vessels that says basically, Lord, here I am, take me. Whatever you want me to do, I am willing to do. This is the ground in which revival is born. I hope and pray that inside of your church, if you're struggling, like most of the churches are, to maybe even see one single convert in a year, I want to encourage you to think about how you can make your heart ready, how you can be receptive to the Spirit of God, and how you can ask Him over and over again, purify me, cleanse me from all unrighteousness, and give me the passion to leap for joy the moment you ask me to do something in your kingdom. This is the essence of revival. And can it happen today? Absolutely, of course it can, because the same spirit that we have today is the same spirit that the 120 got way back on the day of Pentecost. So yes, it can happen. 
but we've got to prepare our hearts to meet our Lord, our Savior, our King. Amen and amen to that. May God bless you today.